All right. Hello and welcome to episode three of our Sunbelt Hoops with Matt and Nate podcast countdown to Pensacola. And indeed, the countdown's getting low. We're getting, you know, we're getting close to liftoff here and, and starting basketball in Pensacola and the uh, the cutthroat tournament, as I like to call it, Nate. That's it. I got my palm, sh- palm tree shirt on getting ready for Pensacola. Well. Like, You're ready. Away. You're ready. All right. So coming up here and podcast episode three we're going to hear from james madison coach mark byington they just set the program records for regular season wins of course they've got a great resume going to hear from him on those subjects and many more we'll take a look at the big stories of the week we're going to name our team of the week our starting five for the week preview the big game of the week and also again look at the tournament if it started today let me tell you it's a little bit of a headache because there's there's (laughs) There's some some bunched up teams in there, and I had to dig really deep. And I don't know whether I got it right or not, but we're going to roll what I got because, I mean, we're going deep in the tiebreakers here to figure out what they're hey, seated wise right now. So yep. good news is at the end of the regular season, the conference handles all that. And so we don't yeah. have to decide the tiebreakers. All right, let's start with the, uh, the big stories of the week. For me, it's, you know, App State reclaims the number one seed, at least for now in the tournament, uh, 85-73 win over Marshall, and then they uh, knock off Louisiana, 85-73. It was a 73-58 win over Marshall, 85-73 win over Louisiana. They're now 22-5 and overall, 12-2 and in the Sun Belt with four games to go. Nate, those 22 wins make the Mountaineers one of only three teams, make that nine teams in the country to hit that number so far. And they have 12 Sun Belt wins. That ties the program's record for most conference victories in a season. Yeah, way back when, when I was there with Coach Kremens, we were 23 and 6 going into the NCAAs. We had won the Southern Conference Tournament. We were really good. These guys are better. They really are. And it's a tough league. It is in tough, next to impossible to win on the road. And they have just done it all. They filled that place, I think, three times. And uh, Coach Kremens has it going a little bit. But as he knows, and every coach in the league knows, he's probably going to have to win that tournament to, to advance to the NCAAs, but he's got four games left before he gets there. But his kids are playing really well. They're very good defensively. And they got Donovan Gregory at the end of every game to just make a great decision, and he's done it more times than not. Yeah, Gregory, uh, it seems like every week now, Gregory's coming up big for them at the end of a game. Yep. And they had 6,500-plus there for the uh, Louisiana game. That would sell out a lot of Sunbelt arenas. I think the home center holds eight. So great crowds, great enthusiasm, great support. Apple on a tremendous history-making season. Speaking of history-making seasons, leads that to our second point in our hot topics, big topic this week, James Madison. They have uh, tied the uh, – they've set the program record for regular season wins. Did that with the 87-80 win over Georgia Southern on Saturday. They're now 24-3 and overall. 11 and 3 in the Sun Belt. That uh, sets the regular season record for overall wins and uh, ties the record for most wins in a season. That was set by Lou Campanelli's 1981 82 NCAA tournament team. Uh, and we'll hear from uh, Coach Bynes and coming up here in just a few minutes. Yeah, Coach Campanelli, that's going way back. He was a more than enthusiastic man on the sidelines, no question about it. And of course, the great one. The left-hander coach there as well. We'll talk about him later. But Coach Byington's definitely got to go. They won their first 14 in a row. They started out in Michigan State in overtime with a win. And uh, they have done very well. The tough part for them, I believe, is they have four games to go. They're all on the road. And then they go to Pensacola. So they played a bunch of conference games at home, obviously. Last four on the road um, doesn't mean they can't win them, but it's tough to win on the road in any league, especially in the Sun Belt. They're going to have to work cut out for them to stay where they are or even climb up higher in the standings uh, with two weekends to go. Yeah, we're still in February, and they've already played their final home game yep. of the season. The only way they'll get a home game from here on out is if they are in the NIT, which is not what they want. But no. uh, that would be the only possibility is that if they end up being in the NIT. And certainly we're pulling for the NCAA tournament uh we're not pulling from the win the conference championship. We're pulling for everybody to win the conference championship because we're unbiased here. But, you know, sure. we're pulling for them to get an at-large if they don't win the conference championship. That remains to be seen. Well, I, did, I, did the game, 
I did the game last Thursday with Georgia Southern at Coastal Carolina, and I was talking to Danny Reed, the radio guy, after the game, and Coastal won the game, and he said, yeah, and guess what? We go to go, get to go up to JMU. This is last Saturday, and it's senior day because it's their last home game. Yeah. And uh, JMU won that with two Yeah, it was 87, 80, so, you know, the yeah. Eagles were able to keep it within 10. It's not easy to do there in, in Harrisonburg. So, uh, big topic number three, college basketball says goodbye to legendary coach Charles Lefty Drizell. Both you and I knew him well. He passed away at the age of 92 will forever be remembered as one of those colorful figures in college basketball. Came from that era where there were so many colorful figures. And, and yeah. most of them still with us today. Sonny Smith, Wimp Sanderson, Hugh Durham, you know, all those guys uh, just who were, you know, they were just big personalities. And you don't necessarily see that as much in college basketball today as you did back then. But finished just shy of 800 career victories. He Won 100-plus games with four different programs. Only coach ever to do that. Turned Maryland. I don't know whether he actually turned Maryland into the UCLA of the East, which is what he said he wanted to do when he took over the Terrapins program. But he turned him into a college basketball power. Ultimately, they won a national championship, not with him as the head coach. But in large part because of the foundation, I would say that Coach Drizell built there. Uh, never coached a Sun Belt team, but did coach James Madison and Georgia State, uh, and put both those team those teams both, of course, are now in the Sun Belt. Well, I had the great pleasure. My sophomore, I went to University of Maryland. My sophomore year is when Coach Drizell came, and uh, a guy across the hall from me in the dorm was a manager. And I used to go to practice every day and just sit there and watch because I wanted to be a college basketball coach because of Coach Drizell. I mean, his presence, um, the team would come out and warm up, Coalfield House, 15,500, and the place would go nuts. And I'll talk about why in a minute. And then the place would calm down. Then they'd play Jesus Christ Superstar. And the left-hander would walk out. The place would go nuts, and he'd throw that big left-handed V in the air, and they'd go, I'm getting chills thinking about it. They'd go crazy again. Now, remember, I told somebody this the other day, and they said, I don't remember that. In 1970, 1970, freshmen did not play college basketball. They were ineligible. So Lefty went out and recruited Tom McMillan, Lenny Elmore, John Lucas, Howard White, Guys like that that did not play on the varsity. So the freshmen would play first and Cole Fieldhouse would be filled. They were undefeated. Nobody beat them. And then the varsity would come out under Coach Frank Fellows. And I was there, but there was about a thousand other people there. Everybody left. Then when they became sophomores, they became unbelievable. Uh, really good player. I still hate Ernie DiGregorio to this day because they knocked him out of the NCAA tournament. Um... And left, people don't understand, Midnight Madness, that was Lefty Drizell's idea. He went out to the track which surrounded the football field of Maryland at midnight and ran a mile run. And that turned into Midnight Madness in practice at midnight. He hired the first African-American assistant coach in the ACC, George Raveling, who went on to great things as well in Washington State and other places. So he did things that other people didn't do. When he got knocked out of the tournament, um, by North Carolina State, only the winner went. And because the of that, ACC tournament, yes. Right, the ACC tournament. He lobbied the fact that this isn't right. There's too many good teams in this league that didn't win the tournament. And hence, the NCAA tournament expanded because of what he said and others said. So he did so many great things. And uh, I remember going up to him in the Final Four once and told him, Coach, you're the reason I wanted to be a coach. And he was a very big man, huge man, very gracious man, and, and said, thank you. I told him I was a student in Maryland. People don't understand, too. He played at Duke, had a, had a scholarship, wanted to go to Tennessee, but he was married at the time. And they didn't accept married students, so he went to Duke, won the first Duke ACC championship. And I, told, during, I listened to his Hall of Fame speech the other day. told a great story. When he went back to Duke, people would put... Skull caps are on so they look like me, and, he, and they'd say, Coach, can you please sign it? And he, he would put an X with quotes around it. 
and they take it off and look and say, Coach, what's this? He said, I went to Duke, but you people think I'm stupid, so I'll just put an X down there. <laughs> but that was awesome. He was larger than life. Uh, the, the world of college basketball is going to miss him. Uh, great man. And uh, coached at two schools in the Sun Belt, of course, Georgia Southern, uh, not Georgia Southern, Georgia, Georgia State, State and JMU. Yeah, I mean, he was this close to signing Moses Malone. And he tells me when he recruited Moses Malone out of Virginia, yeah. he went to his house. They had a dirt floor. They were that poor. Of course, Moses Malone turns out to be one of the greatest players of all time. Uh, never played college. Went straight to the ABA and then the NBA. And, you know, the other thing that I will relate about Georgia State is uh, that's where I got to know him. He was 66 when he took over the Georgia State program. Yeah. Georgia State was outside of a, a couple of good years with Bob Reinhart, dear friend. I mean, they were a big nothing. I mean, a big, I mean, they were about as big a nothing as you could be. And he attacked that job with such great passion and energy and turned them into a basketball school. I mean, he was the guy that started that. So, All right, next big story. If anybody has not watched his Basketball Hall of Fame speech, it would be the best 15 minutes he's spent watching anything in a long time. It's hysterical. He's the best. And uh, it was really, really good. Yeah, yeah. All right, big story number four, Caleb Fields. Makes Arkansas State history, and I'm glad I, I got a chance to interview Caleb when we hosted the Sunbelt Basketball Media Days for the conference on ESPN+. Plus. And, you know, he played hurt most of last year. I mean, he played with a broken wrist most of the season. And he's now fully really healthy. Yeah, he, um, he becomes the eighth player in program history to go over 1,500 career points. Did that in their 82-71 win at Troy. You know, not only is he scoring the ball, He's setting up his teammates. He has five games this year with 10-plus assists. And uh, there, you know, there's only like three players in the country, or he's third in the country, I should say, in that number. And, you know, you take all the other Sunbelt players and add them up, and nobody is even at that number. He's second in program history with 619 career assists. We'll see him at the tournament. And he's a big reason why this Arkansas State team, I'm starting to feel a little bit, about them like I did last year with South Alabama, a team that's getting hot at the right time. Well, and he's playing under a new coach. I mean, a whole new yeah. system where they, they really he's love flourished. the three. He's flourished. Yeah, absolutely. They love the three. <laughs> There's a lot of chance for a lot of assists. And if they crowd the three-point shooters, he can go by and lay it in. So, yeah, I remember him playing with a broken wrist last year, all wrapped up. They said surgery after the tournament. But, yeah, he, uh, he has taken advantage of a new situation and done exceptionally well. And they're on a little bit of a roll going into the last four games. They are indeed. All right, our, our big story number five and our last one, Southern Miss suffers their first Sun Belt home loss. Now, I say this. This is not a negative. This is actually a positive. They won their first 13 home games in the conference before they ever lost one. Did not lose it all last year. Finally dropped their first home game. Uh, in the Sun Belt in Reed Green Coliseum this past week when they lost to ULM 68-59. They bounced back and, and beat uh, Texas State 78-74 on Saturday. But the last two seasons, they are 26-2 and in Hattiesburg. Yeah, that's impressive. Uh, beautiful facility. Obviously, their head coach had a uh, heart incident, and he's not going to finish the season, but... Uh, they're, they're really good at home, obviously, and uh, they want to take that into the tournament. But that's an amazing record. Only two years in the league and only lost two games. Time now to welcome in James Madison coach Mark Byington. Mark, thanks a lot for being with us. Congratulations on what to this point has been a fabulous season, a record-setting season, 24-3 and overall. You're 11 and three in the conference. Your net ranking is 55. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through this conversation. But what's been the secret sauce to turning James Madison into a Sun Belt Conference Championship contender? Yeah, I mean that's that's tough to answer. Um, thanks for having me on. It's um, it's it, it's the right players that care about the right things is number one, and you know not only are they talented but they care about winning. And, you know, they've, they've bought in and is trying to be better every day. And, you know, for whatever happened in the past, 
you know, whether it was good or bad, and there's been a lot of good, they've, they've came to work every day the next day and ready to go. And um, they care about each other. So finding the mix of having a team like that is it, it's hard. It's hard in this day and age. Uh, there's a lot of roster turnover and changes, and, and this team's been really good at it. You know, Coach, obviously you started out the season unbelievable with the two overtime wins at Michigan State. And then 14 run, everybody's probably feeling really good about themselves, including you. How have you dealt with the mentality of then getting into so much? You only lost a couple or three of them, but the mentality of nobody can beat us. And now we lost a couple, but now you're in the stretch run here. Well, Nate, you used to be a coach, and did you ever have the mentality that nobody could beat us? No, I, I, no, I, I've never been that way. Our, our scout team wins a lot of times in, in our practice, and then and, and so <laughs> um, it, it was never at that point. Um, you, you know, the one thing I, I think it's um, I think it's unfair, but it, I think it's accurate that like the teams that beat us, like give them credit, like they played really good, yep. and guess what like they got good players and good coaches and and tough environments and and everything else and so sometimes it's not all about you and it could be you know you could play well and do some things and and other teams give them credit for what they've done um the one thing i like that we've had to deal with and i think it's that that's put us in a, in a good place is after that first week of the season we've been kind of the favorite or the target on our back or everything else every game we play and we go to places and they have their best crowd and best environment. And, and, and we, we see teams that we'll watch on film sometimes. And, and the times we go out and play them, we're like, this isn't the same team. This is way better than what we just saw. And, but what that does to us is we better be good. We better play it every single night and be ready to go. And we've taken a lot of teams, really good shots and been successful. And sometimes we take another team's good shot and we're not successful, but, um, I think we've approached every game the right way. You know, it was November, and I don't want to jump off that Michigan State game too much, and I know you want to – it was November. It's been a long time ago. There's been a lot of basketball play, but that's a signature win for a program to be able to go in there and beat Tom Izzo's team, one of the storied programs of college basketball. What was that like for you uh, and for your, your team, maybe even more so for you because you – understand the history of college basketball probably a lot better than those young men do and I'm sure they had an appreciation for it but even you a greater appreciation for being able to go in there and get a win like that well the biggest thing that 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 took took from that is I learned a lot about our team in that situation and to play in front of that environment um and I even look at their record right now they're 13 and 2 at home right now and uh luckily you got one one of those two Luckily, we got one of them, but but they've been good in that building, you know, even after we left. And um, but I learned a lot about our team. And the other part of it is I haven't had time to reflect. I don't really. I will, but I'm not going to like right now. And I mean, I really walked off the court of, of, of just, you know, our team just beat Michigan State and thinking Kent State's going to be much harder because of this. <laughs> And, you know, like, like I just knew, like, all that's going to come with that. And I haven't enjoyed the positives. That's going to help in recruiting. It was great for our fan base. It, it woke them up. It was right in the middle of football season. And, you know, it's like everybody's kind of like, what, you know, what's the basketball team going to look like? And, and we put it front and center um, in, in front of them right away. So there was a lot of positives. We'll still kind of see those later on. But. As a coach, it was like, hey, all right, let's move on now. I'll try to get the next one. You know, Mark, I've watched you coach a lot of times in a lot of different schools. And the thing that I love about watching your kids play, and they do it really well at JMU, they did it at Georgia Southern as well. I always say, a lot of, when you play a team, sometimes you guard what they do. But you guys seem to take people out of what they want to do, which makes it very uncomfortable for them, and obviously good for you with the steals and everything else. Is that a day one mentality? Is that recruit that kind of player? How does that fit into your whole system? Yeah, I think it's. I think you're right. It's it's with the type of player, um, and then I got good assistant coaches, and and you know one of the things they always say about Bill Belichick is he tries to make the other team play left handed, and 
you know, we try to do some of that, but you can't change who you are when you're doing it. You hopefully you already right. have that in your scheme and, and what you're trying to do. And I do feel this. I always feel like the top three defensive teams in the league are going to be the top three ranked teams in the league by standings. And so that's always our goal. And we've scored the points and everything else. But if you look at our practices, probably 70% of them, 75% of them are defense oriented. It's working. <laughs> it is working. And congratulations on that. Now, I know, look, I know the goal is win out. Win this thing out and win the Sun Belt Conference uh, Tournament Championship in Pensacola. Go in to the NCAA Tournament as the automatic qualifier. Uh, that's plan A. Plan B, you have a net ranking of 55. So I think my opinion is you're putting yourself, if not in the conversation, close to being in the conversation of being a team that if they don't win the conference championship, they got a chance as an at-large. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, all that's, you know, there's things in your control and there's things out of your control. And, you know, whether we're um, put on a bracketology or whatever else, and, you know, we can't control that. And what we control is, is, is who we are, and really it, it's that day who we are. And we're not looking past that. And you know what? Our, our main mission right now is to try to beat Marshall on, on Wednesday, and that's all we're really looking at. And then after that, you try to win the next one. And then you get down to Pensacola. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, it's the best and the worst. I mean, it's, it, it's the best because it's the most intense pressure, um, exhilarating, fun, like all these different emotions that you go through. Um, but it's the worst because, you know, like, you know, it can be over in a game and there's no double elimination and there's no protection there. So what we got to do is control what you control. And, and, and that's today. That's now. That's us. And then when we get to the end of that, somebody else is going to have to you know, have an opinion of us to be able to put us in there. And we got to do the work we can day to day to make that a better decision for them and make that you know easier decision for them. You know, Mark, the schedule is what it is. And you played your uh, your last home game the other night. So now is it the mentality of it's almost like it's tournament type because you got four in a row now on the road before you do go to Pensacola? Yeah, the road's challenging for everybody. And then what we're about to face is some... Um, it's really difficult. And, you know, we've played more home games in conference than we played road games. Um, so it's got to be equal for everybody. Uh, do I like having the last four on the road? No. A lot of times you need to come back home and sure. you know, settle in. But um, we're going to be tested. And we've been tested all year. Going on the road for this long of a stretch is a big test towards the end of the year when teams are tired and they're beat up a little bit and they're mentally drained, physically drained. You know, we got to find a way, and um, we'll, we'll go one at a time. It's going to go quick because, you know, we, we, we play Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Friday, and um, the game's going to come at you quick, and we got to make sure that we know it's a challenge, embrace it, go after it. The schedule is what it is. We got to go play it. You know, shift gears a little bit. Uh, despite your youthful appearance, you've been in the game a long time as a – Head coach, assistant hey, coach. Hey, hey, Matt, put Play. your glasses back on. <laughs> and, uh, and player. No, you're still very youthful looking. You look great. Uh, and a player, too. So I'm, I'm guessing that in your playing days, Coach Charles Lefty Drizel was still coaching. Uh, the, I don't know that your coaching paths ever crossed, but did you ever have, and he was a James Madison coach, uh, of course, long before you, and a, a Georgia State coach, and long before either one of those teams were in the Sun Belt Conference, but nonetheless, a guy who left an indelible image, an imprint on the game of college basketball. Uh, your thoughts on uh, on the life to, of, of Coach Drizel and now his passing this past week? Yeah, I mean, he, he's legendary in college basketball and made a huge impact here at James Madison. Um, I encountered him, I, well, the, well, the first memory I have of him was I was, I loved the ACC growing up. And, you know, some, for some young people that probably don't realize, Maryland was in the ACC. And, and Lefty had some incredible teams, put Maryland on the map. Maryland wasn't a basketball place. Um, and, and had teams there that were just tremendous teams. And I used to go to the ACC tournament with, with my family and my high school coach and different people. And 
And seeing Lefty on the sideline was just this almost like, enormous figure, like literally and figuratively, um, his team. Um, but then, you know, I had a chance to go against him. He was at JMU when I was a player and, and going to compete against him. And his teams are really good, some talented teams, great coach. Um, but kind of reflecting back, I didn't have much of a chance on Saturday when I first heard back. But just seeing the impact that he made in college basketball, it, it's enormous. I mean, to win 100 games at four different schools, I mean, that's, that's so hard. It, it, it's hard to win 100 at one. And it's hard to be hired four times. It's hard to, like, do that at four different places. Like, that is really difficult. So you're good everywhere you go. And um, and, and just uh, I love the fact, too, that he was so innovative. He'd think outside the box. Like, midnight madness and doing different things yeah. that, you know, um, uh, I know he had a team there, and it's almost like the Sun Belt. He had an unbelievable team at Maryland, and they did not win their conference tournament and could not go to the NCAA tournament, had one of the best. It's crazy, teams. wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, it's almost like how the Sun Belt is now where, you know, you could have, you know, the best team or second best team or third best team and not get there. And um, But he made that change. You know, he made that say, look, this isn't fair. This isn't right. And, you know, let's put our best teams in there. And um, Just a forward thinking, a thinking out of the box, um, will be missed. Um you know, in, in college basketball, um, we want to honor him. We want to make sure he's remembered here and uh, for all the things he did at JMU especially. Coach, I remember in the old arena up there, um, I did a game, and as I was leaving, I climbed up the steps, and there was this huge picture of Michael Bublé, who was in concert there, obviously. And next to it was a huge picture of Coach Rizzell. Do you know if those photos, are, are they in your new arena? Uh, there is a picture of him in our new arena. If you go on the wall, he's he's honored there. And, um, you know, he had a lot, a lot of regular season championships here. And yep. and then, um, well, he had a guy named Kent Coluco make, make, make a game win an out-of-bounds three that uh, that got him in the NCAA tournament here. So um, he's definitely remembered here. And, and I'll, I'll hear stories all the time, even when I first got yep. here, of, of former players and people in town and this and that and, and I love hearing him um, just about the impact he made here. Mark, you and I have known each other a long time, going back to your days as an assistant coach at, at College of Charleston. And I know that uh, your programs, directly or indirectly or whatever, you always end up coaching or recruiting guys in the Atlanta area. And, of course, that's where I live. I live in the Atlanta area. But Terrence Edwards and T.J. Bickerstaff, those are two of your top guys come from Atlanta. James Madison's a long way from Atlanta. What's, you know, how's – What's your secret to being able to pluck guys out of Atlanta, such a talent-rich uh, basketball community and city? Yeah, so um, it was funny. When I got hired at, at Georgia Southern, um, we knew how important Atlanta was. And and then a comment that I heard multiple times was, how is a Virginia guy going to recruit Georgia and recruit Atlanta? And we went in there and built relationships. And that's what we did. And, and had guys on my staff that were from Atlanta – I still have two guys on my staff that are, are from Atlanta, and, and uh, Bobby Crimmins' nephew, Nate, and uh, John Crimmins, and then Matt Buckland sure. is also um, from there. And we've kept those connections. It's such a good basketball city. It's, you know, rank it however you want to rank. You're not getting probably down further than, than two or three on the list of any city in the country where you're saying, all right, the best high school basketball. It's one, two, or three. It, it is really good um, talent, coaches, competition. And, you know, we've already signed a player coming from next year that's going to, that's from Atlanta as well that's um, similar. We're always going to do it. We're always going to recruit the area. Um, and I like the fact that the Sun Belt's kind of wrapped around there. So when we say come to JMU in Virginia, well, we're going to play a lot of games, you know, pretty easy to get to from Atlanta. And um, so that's good for the families and, we're going to stay there. We're going to recruit there. And um, I wouldn't be a smart guy if I did not recruit Atlanta, knowing how good the players are. Coach, speaking about one player in particular, Xavier Brown was not a starter, then became a starter, and kind of ignites your defense with his steals and his anticipation, all that stuff. I mean, just how much better has he gotten as the season went on? Yeah, I mean, he's always um, been good. It's – and what we had to do is we had to fit lineups and change things or, along sure. the way. But his, his energy, we just had to get on the court. Um, and, 
especially his defensive energy, but it's, it's yeah. really his overall energy. And, and, you know, he can change the game that way. And he, and he's had that, he's done that, um, that, that, you know, we ha he'll have games like he did last game. He might make three threes and some other games where he'll have some offense, but it's his, his leadership, his energy, his contagious energy, that that's what we need. And, and that's been good for us. It's really helped us. Mark, thanks a lot for being with us. Really do appreciate it. Uh, love visiting with you here on the podcast. And we look forward to Pensacola. It's just a couple of weeks away. And like you said, all those things that you said about it earlier, it's intense, it's fun, uh, a lot more fun for Nate and I because we don't win or lose. We just win. Uh, we don't get any losses. It's just winning for us, exciting games. And I know for you guys, the coaches, it's a lot more intense than that. Yeah, you guys get to laugh at all of us being stressed out and then feeling all the pressure. And uh, it's got to be great for the fans. Um, you know, it's um, the, our type of tournament. I mean, if you're a fan, that you got to get there and see it because you can feel it in the arena. It, it's yeah. one of the best. It's one of the best in the country. It really is. Thank you. Appreciate it. Always great to visit with Coach Mark Byington. Look forward to visiting with him some more as the team gets to Pensacola and plays in the Sun Belt Tournament. All right, Nate, let's continue on with the podcast. And uh, time now to choose our team of the week. Who you got? Well, I'm going with the Chanticleers of Coastal Carolina. Um, an unusual season for them as Coach Cliff Ellis retires um, in December of 2023 and 13-year assistant associate head coach, I should say, Benny Moss, Named the interim head coach. So a shock to the team, a shock to the coaches. Remember, Coach Moss told me as soon as Coach Ellis told him, the first thing he said to Coach Ellis was, are you sure? Do you really want to do this? And Coach Ellis said, yeah, he was sure. Well, Benny Moss takes over, and it was a rough start. They lost a post player to injury. They lost a point guard who was playing really well, and they've been through some really tough times. But last weekend... They win two in a row. Um, they have the leading double-double guy in the league, John Ogiaco, who just got his 15th double-double of the season. He's the leading rebounder in the league as well, and he's in the top 10 in the NCAA in double-doubles, rebounds, and field goal percentage. And most importantly, there are four teams that went 2-0 and o in the league. Three of them are in the top half or top third of the league. Coastal Carolina is not, but they're fighting like crazy to get out of that bottom five. And they're, they're there, but of course there's four to go in all tiebreakers. Yeah. But they went 2-0 and in the league, and now uh, they're playing really well. So I'm going with the Coastal Carolina Shonda Clears two road games. They have two more home games, excuse me, two home games that they won. They go on the road this weekend, and then they have two home games to finish the regular season. I got the privilege of doing all their home games. So uh, we'll see what they do on the road, and then they got two more at home. Unfortunately, last game of the year is against JMU at home, but they won two, and I'm picking them as my team of the week. Yeah, that's a good choice, and uh, I'm pull, you know, I'm, you know, not pulling for them more than I'm pulling for anybody else, but pulling for them just simply because all they've been through this year, and, and, and of course because of our great affection, my great affection for Coach Cliff Ellis, sure. who retired back in December, just good for Coach Benny Moss to, you know, put something together here. Maybe they can put something together and make a strong yeah. run heading into the tournament. So my team of the week is going to be App State. I know that's kind of a no-brainer, but they beat Marshall. They beat Louisiana last week. So they reclaim, at least for right now, the number one spot in the Sun Belt Tournament. Uh, they're 13-0 and at home this season, all those things we talked about earlier in the show. And, again, they're kind of a theme here. They were down nine points again. Not a, quite as dramatic as when they were now nine with a minute and a half to play and came back and beat Toledo in overtime, you know, two Saturdays ago. But they're down nine to Louisiana in the second half, and they come back and win that game. Jordan Marsh had 17 of his career-high 23 points in the last 12 minutes of the game to uh, spark the team to victory. So App State, my team of the week. Time to move to our starting five. Starting five, our five best impact players in the Sun Belt Conference this uh, past week. And, Nate, you go first. Give us your first Well, start. I went with my four-out, one-in lineup. And the one-in is Hosanna Katingay, who started <laughs> at Coastal Carolina 
and uh, then transferred and has now ended up at UL Monroe. Um, I love watching this kid UL play. Lafayette. He's Louisiana Lafayette. Pardon me? Oh, excuse me, Louisiana. Monroe. I know that. Um, well, you just he smiles the entire time on the floor. He's laughing the whole time. And he must, must have been really smiling because Thursday he had 12 points and 17 rebounds, which is a really good game. Saturday, game. 17 boards. 17 rebounds is tied for the most in the league in a single game, in Sunbelt games, because now it's all about Sunbelt play. And on Saturday, he has 23 points and 13 rebounds. So, and that's against absent at Appalachian State, who's the best shot blocker maybe in the country, definitely in the Sunbelt. And he gets 23 points again. And trust me, Hosanna Gatinge does not take outside shots. It's all in the paint. 6'7", about 260 pounds, wide body. But he did it against the best big man defender in the league. So Hosanna Gatinge um, is my postman for my starting five. I'll go Second with that. I'll, I'll yeah. jump in here, and I'll say, yeah, I'll, I got Katenge on my starting five, too. 35 total points, 30 total rebounds yeah. for the week. He had three double-doubles for the entire season prior to the start of last week. Picks up two last week, so now he's up to five for the season. He's on my team, too. He's in my starting five. Go ahead. Player number two. Number two, I'm going with the... Dukes of JNU and Terrence Edwards. Thursday, not a bad game. 28 points, no. four threes, four rebounds, three assists. Saturday, not 28, but he had 19, four rebounds and three assists. He does it all for JMU. He can score at all three levels for Coach Byington. He's the unquestioned leader of that team, in my opinion. And they got two wins because that's usually what they do in a weekend is get two wins. But Terrence Edwards for the Dukes. I got Terrence Edwards in my starting five as well. Agree with you on that. Uh, might be the player of the year in the conference. Uh, yep. Just a, a tremendous score, clutch player for Mark Byington. All right, player number three. Arkansas State, Terran Todd. He's kind of a 6'6 six, six guy that plays in, not inside really, plays on the wing. Thursday, 19 points, he made three threes. Saturday, 21 points, and he made three threes. So that's averaging over 20, or right at 20 for the weekend. And most importantly for Arkansas State, two wins. They love the three. They're all into the analytics of the three. And he's a big part of their basketball team. Now I got Terran Todd in my starting five as well. 40 total points for the week. As you mentioned, Arkansas State going 2-0. and And uh, he has now led their team in scoring for four straight games. Okay, I'm going out of the box for my next two because I love these two guys. Like I say, I get to do all the shot home games. But Jacob Meyer is a freshman who scored over 3,200 points in high school. Thursday night, he has 16 points, four rebounds, two assists. He's a 6'2 guard. He might be the best guard rebounder in the Sun Belt. Saturday, he gets 21 points, six assists, excuse me, six rebounds and four assists. Um, he has led them in scoring most of the season at around 14, 15 a game. Um, he does not take a lot of threes and didn't take them in high school and f scored 3,200 points. That's I think crazy. he's the leading candidate for freshman of the year because with Vashon Alette no longer on the ODU roster, he's a leading freshman scorer in the league. And uh, I just like to watch him play. He's got an amazing heart. And he used to be a two-guard. Sometimes he plays the point guard, so he's got a lot of responsibilities. He's a special freshman basketball player for the Shots. I agree with you on Jacob. He might be the uh, freshman of the year. Um, I do not have him in my starting five. I got Austin Crowley again. I know that's a, a familiar theme with me. He's good. A preseason player of the year. 41 total points, 15 rebounds this past week as the Golden Eagles split the week. Uh, lost to ULM, beat Texas State. Double-double. Uh, against the Warhawks uh, in, the, in the Thursday game. And so he becomes the first Southern Miss player in 10 years to have three straight double-doubles. And he's a guard. And, he's, and, he's, and these are, you know, these are uh, rebounding and points. I think he had a, I think he had yeah. a points and assists double-double as well. So he's very diverse in, in his talent. 
in that he can he can fill up the stat sheet. All right, our final starting five player. Okay, my last guy, I'm going with Colin Blackman. He's a guard who led the Chanticleers early in the season in scoring, and then he lost it. He was taking bad shots. He was not making shots. And give him credit, the last three or four games, he has been amazingly good. Thursday night, he had a career-high 31 points against Georgia Southern, 6 of 8 from 3. That's the fourth highest of any single game scorer in Sunbelt Conference play this year. And Saturday, he had 14 points and made four threes. For the season, he's shooting 34% from three. For the weekend, he shot 62%, 10 of 16 from three. And I did a little deep dive, and I talked to him about this before Saturday's game. There's something that a fan, and we won't say who, makes him. It's called a dirt cake. It's Oreos and something else. But he said, can somebody, can you make me a dirt cake? They did the four Thursdays game, and it worked. He had 31 points. I said that to him, and he started laughing. He says, yes, sir, I love that dirt cake. Did they have a dirt but cake Saturday, for him on the sat, for the Saturday game? Well, that's what I said. They should have. Saturday game, I mean, you missed, you scored 31 and had a dirt cake. you got to have a dirt <laughs> cake every day, right? Absolutely. Well, we, this lady walked up to us in a restaurant after the game. You've got to have a dirt Carter, cake every game when you score And 30. told us. So, all right, my uh, final player is going to be uh, Samuel Tabe of the South Alabama Jaguars. He had uh, 48 total points for the week, nine rebounds, and that included a career-high 35. He dropped a 35 in their 75-73 loss to the Red Wolves. He went 15 for 24 from the field. He had 24 field goal attempts in this game, Nate. And he uh, is he, he's in my starting five. So we agreed on three of the guys. We disagreed. Not necessarily disagreed out of difference of opinion sure. on, the, uh, on the other two guys. That's our starting five for the week. Let's preview the week coming up. Game starting on Wednesday. Got Wednesday. We're going Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday this week. So who's your uh, game of the week? Well, there's some really good games coming up, but I like the Troy Arkansas State on Thursday the 22nd. They'll go Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday this week because I just think it's a great matchup. That's a, Troy, that's a national really TV good. game. That's going to be on ESPN. Yep, yep. and it deservedly so. Um, Troy, really good defensively up at the top of the league. Arkansas State trying to fight to get in that top four. They can still get there, but... As we said earlier, they are on a roll right now. Um, they believe in the new system. They're making threes. They got Caleb Fields 100% healthy. Uh, I think that's going to be a heck of a basketball game. Um, Troy has to go to Arkansas State on the U. You know, I was watching the little side, Eddie, and then I'll give you. I'm watching on Saturday basketball, and I watch as Virginia beats Wake Forest 49-47. That's a halftime score. Nope, that's a full game score. Yeah. Virginia went one for 11 at the free throw line, Nate, and they won the game. They hit their last free throw to secure the victory. Amazing. It's 2024, and they did play with a shot clock, and neither team got to 50. It was crazy. I say that I because. Did that. I say I did that watch because that. of this Arkansas State Troy game. They might, the, you know, the leading team might have 50 by halftime. So Absolutely. It'll, it's, it'll be, that'll be a fun watch, and that's on ESPN U on Thursday night. But my game of the week, and this does tie into what you were talking about with Arkansas State, so they'll be watching this game with great interest as well, especially if they beat Troy on Thursday night. It takes on even greater significance. But my game of the week is going to be Louisiana at Southern Miss. They're at Reed Green Coliseum. Saturday, 2 o'clock Central Time, that's on ESPN+. Plus. If these two teams take care of business on Thursday and ULM's playing, or UL Louisiana is playing at ULM and USM is hosting South Alabama, if they both win, that means the Cajuns will be 10-5 and five in the conference, the Eagles 9-6. and six. So a Southern Miss win over Louisiana on Saturday would put them in a tie with Louisiana for the number four spot 
in the conference, and we all know how important the top four is. That gets you, that gets you all the way, uh, you know, the buys all the way until Saturday, so you've missed the first two rounds. But that would be big because that – so that sets it up. That could be a game for a tie for fourth, and, of course, at that point, Southern Miss would have the tiebreaker on Louisiana in, in a head-to-head. Now, Arkansas State also figures in this thing because if they beat Troy on Thursday – then they're also going to be in a spot where they might be able to be in that tie that we're talking about. But uh, it won't settle the story, however, because six days later, final game of the regular season, the Golden Eagles have to play at Louisiana. But in order, really, probably for that game to mean anything as far as the seedings, Southern Miss needs to beat them on Saturday. But this is... This, this Saturday, this weekend, the game that you talked about, the game I'm talking about, those are the entry points for Arkansas State and Southern Miss to perhaps jump into yep. the top four, maybe knock out Louisiana for a top four seed. Marshall looks like now at 7-7. Seven and seven, They're probably not in that conversation anymore. So, anyway. Which leads us to our last feature on our Sunbelt podcast with Matt and Nate. Uh, and it's if the tournament started today. So there have been a few changes, and like I said, this was a little bit of a headache because there are four teams tied at uh, 5 and 9, which would be the 9, 10, 11, and 12 seeds, which is a big deal because if you're 9 and 10, you don't have to play that first day. If you're 11 and 12, you do have to play that first day. So the first round, Tuesday, March 5th, Pensacola, we get it. You know, if you can't get to Pensacola, Nate and I are going to have that game for you on ESPN+. Plus. You're looking at 12 ULM versus 13 Texas State, and you're looking at 11 Georgia Southern versus 14 Old Dominion. Well, Texas State's going to bring their defense. They always do. Coach Richard and ULM obviously um, doesn't want to be where they are in the bottom four, but he's got an offensive team that can be explosive. So it's going to be offensive them against defense of Texas State, Georgia Southern, same uh, modus operandi as Arkansas State. Both former assistant coaches at Alabama love the three. And Old Dominion has been really hot and cold. All right, uh, I think they've you been froze up on me. Sometimes right they can score yeah. a lot of points when they don't make shots. They have not been good. So that that's that's going to be an interesting basketball game. Um, neither of them want to be in the bottom four. And none of the four do. But if they are, they are. There's nothing they can do about it. Now, Old Dominion looks like they, you know, and I'm not going to say for sure, we still got four games to go, but they're the closest to being a lock to being in the Final Four. Everybody else yeah. still has a chance to crawl out of that, including Texas State right now that's in the 13 spot. Second round, Thursday, March 7th, after an off day from men's basketball, you're looking at 8 seed Georgia State versus 9 South Alabama, 9 Southern Miss against the ULM Texas State winner, number 6 Arkansas State against the Georgia Southern ODU winner, and number seven, Marshall versus number 10, Coastal Carolina. So right now, if I'm figuring these tiebreakers right right now, that 2-0 and week for Coastal Carolina, at least for the moment, has bought them a ticket out of the bottom four. Yeah, and I'm sure um, they could care less about what happened last weekend because now it's, they're on the road this weekend. But if it did do that for them and they can get one or two or even two or two on the road, it definitely helps them um, down the road. The other games... In the middle, the, the, the reason these teams are in the middle of the pack is because they're in the middle of the pack. So you can just flip a coin, really. There's no great favorite. There's no great underdog in those games. Oh, you're totally right. I mean, there's, no, you, there's no, none of those games you look at it and say, oh, wow, uh, well, that's, that's going to be a blowout. I mean, there may be blowouts, but you can't look at it and, and see that. Quarterfinals will be Saturday, March 9th. You're looking at uh, the top four seeds being number one app. Number four, Louisiana. They'll be paired against each other. If you have chalk, if you have the, the, the top seeds winning all the way through, you got one app and four, Louisiana, then they would be paired up in the semifinals on that Sunday. You got three, James Madison, right now, and two, Troy, and those two teams will be playing against each other in the semifinals. If all the top seeds were able to win, we know that's probably not going to be the case. We saw it last year. <laughs> with two yeah. of the top four seeds losing in the quarterfinals last year. Yeah, Coach Binder is going to allude to that when we talk to him, but um, that's exactly what it is. And I'm sure Coach Richie Riley is telling his guys, or not yet, that when they're going to Pensacola, guys, hey, we weren't real good last year, but look what we did in Pensacola last year. 
We went all the way to the final. The Texas State. I mean, they were a bottom four yeah, yeah. team, and they got to the yeah. uh, semifinals. They were able to get to the uh, the final four. So anything can happen. And again, uh, I will. if you're if you're a big yeah, if you're a fan of one of these Sun Belt teams, uh, men or women, we invite you to uh, go to Pensacola. You can get your tickets through your individual institutions, or you can get your tickets through Ticketmaster there at the Pensacola Bay Center. Uh, if you can't be there, all the games will be televised. All the uh, games leading up to the championship will be on ESPN Plus, and then the championship games, both men and women, will be on a linear network, but ESPN or ESPN uh, 1, 2, or U. Uh, check your local listings for that, as they like to say. But we'll have all the games, uh, men and women. You and I will be doing the men's bracket, and we invite you to tune in and uh, watch on ESPN Plus. Looking forward to it, Nate. Yeah, I got one jump back. My not game of the week, since we're doing this. Oh, not game of the week. Yeah, go ahead. Go was ahead. the NBA All Star game last night? Oh, I watched I mean, about two minutes of it. It looked like a layup. It looked like a warm up drill on both ends. I saw the final score after I watched a new show on TV called Tracker, which is pretty good. But I saw the final score and I said, "Thank goodness I didn't spend my time watching that game." I like certain teams in the NBA. Yeah. That All Star game is embarrassing. Well, it's it's just it's become just like the uh, the Pro Bowl game, which they ultimately just got rid of in, yeah. in the NFL because it was look if you can't play at full speed, if you can't play it like a game, if you're not going to play defense, and you're just going to you know I mean it's great to see Dame Limber, Lil, Dame Lillard hit three pointers from the half court line, but <laughs> I mean if it, you know if you're not going to take it serious. Uh, I didn't watch it. I didn't watch a second of it. I really didn't. I saw the highlights on the ESPN Sports Center. That's all I needed to see. Yeah. Uh, I knew it would be a game like that. You know. I don't know what they do. I, you know, I don't. I, I, I'm, I, I tell you what they. I tell you what would probably be better than that is if they played three on three. If they just turned it Good into point. a big, you know, like, like a three on three basket or a one on one, you know, and just played it like well, that. And, but this whole, this whole, what they're doing right now is just, just not cut. The one thing I did watch, which was really cool, and I hope I don't mess this lady's name up, uh, UNESCO against Steph Curry in a three-point contest. Yes, yeah, Sabrina that UNESCO. UNESCO. Uh, that was fun to watch. Steph got her, but he didn't that's get her so really late. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Just turn it into, you know, just turn it into, like, uh, you know, one-on-one. Skills competition. One on yeah. one or three on three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, you know, and then maybe they'll play a little bit harder. I don't know. But, I mean, there's just like, it's just, you know, they've tried They've tried Team LeBron, Team Giannis. They went back to the East-West <laughs> Conference designations this year. The, the problem isn't in what you're calling the team. The problem is that they're not playing it like a real game. They're not taking right. it not seriously. Before. Yeah, and if they're not going to take it seriously... Do what? Back to Sunbelt basketball. That's going to be good. They're going to play hard, and it's going to be exciting every minute. They're playing for their lives, proverbial tournament lives. Yep. That's what they're playing for. Exactly. Team. Even, even James Madison, as great as they have played this year, it's going to be all on the line for them. And I don't think, and I do think they do have a shot at an at-large, but I don't think they have a shot at an at-large if they get knocked out before the finals. True. I agree, I 100%. Think, I think their only path, and it still may be limited, but their only path as an at-large would be to win out, not lose any more games, and possibly lose in the finals and still get in because their record will be something like 30 wins and four losses at that point. So that's, True. And, and their net ranking is going to be it's 55 right now as we talk today. So anyway, we'll, we'll tackle that next week on the podcast. We'll be getting we'll be an even – We'll be a week closer to the tournament next week. Yep. Going to be fun.